All right, so moving on. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about the neurophysiology itself. We're going to get into the specifics of uh, the different cells that make up uh, the nervous system. We're talking about uh, some different features here. And this is also where I get to talk a lot about neurotransmitters. So again, it's maybe only 34 slides, but just wait, I can talk a lot about this stuff. I love neurotransmitters. As a pharmacist, it's one of the main ways we get to, to modify stuff in the body. We get to monkey around, do all kinds of things. So we'll talk about those uh, later. So looking at the central nervous system itself, again, over, uh, you know, made up to 100 billion neurons, so quite a few neurons there. And again, uh, we've kind of go, gone over the, the typical structure of a neuron itself. So remember, we always have the cell body, which, okay, laser pointer. We always have the cell body here. Um, you know, where does the signal normally heading down? Which portion of the, the neuron? Down the axon, right? And then we're gonna typically have the synapse down here, and then normally have these dendrites. What's kind of coming into the dendrites? You use a lot of other synapses, right? So we're going to get a lot of input signals coming into the dendrites, all to the cell body, which will then affect uh, the axon itself, which can then either stimulate it, maybe inhibit it. We'll look at that in just a little bit later. Um, again, guess what comes up again here? Action potentials. Yay. No, nope, nothing. Not, okay, that's okay. But again, looking at the connections here, there's uh, many hundreds of thousands of connections depending on what the input fibers uh, you're looking at are. And again, typically the output is going to be through a single axon. And this is good because we want to make sure we have kind of one-way communication for the most part. There's some bipolar nerves that are out there. We've looked at several of those, like in vision and things like that. However, for the most part, we'd like to have signals only being passed in one direction. You know, So you can have lots of inputs coming into a neuron, but you typically want to have one output. Okay. So... Remember, we talked about the sensory uh, portion of the, the nervous system here. We know a lot of information is entering the CNS through peripheral nerves. Typically, we're conducting through things like the spinal cord, the brainstem, cerebellum, the thalamus, kind of that, uh, another kind of uh, command station there where we can kind of control which signals are going where. And then finally, to that cerebellar cortex. Remember, we have the motor cortex being here a little bit more uh, anterior. Behind that's going to be the somatosensory cortex. Where we're getting a lot of information sent in. Uh, remember where vision goes? This is going to be kind of traveling back to the occipital lobe here. So again, you can see a lot of information there. We'll look at some more of the details on that when we get to the uh, the next section uh, or the next unit in this class. But again, I uh, just know we have a lot of different kind of peripheral uh, sort of sensory inputs that are going to be coming in traveling to the brain. So um, as I mentioned, different parts of the nervous system. We have the motor functions. We talked about skeletal muscle activation, et cetera. So I need to go over that. Um, again, also controlling things like endocrine and exocrine uh, sort of uh, function, right? So you know, we talked about a lot about the hypothalamus that releasing different hormones to cause various effects uh, throughout the body. So I'm not going to necessarily go through that. Um, but again, this helps us with many different levels of control. A lot of this being, especially in the lower regions of the brain, is going to be relegated to subconscious control of things, you know, whether it be waking or um, you know, breathing and cardiovascular function, and the higher regions typically concern more deliberate actions, especially up here in the frontal cortex, we're kind of making a decision of what we want to do, um, how we want to proceed with things, make things happen. And again, it's really important that we can try to process all that information, because again, if we got every single signal coming in all at the same time, we didn't have a good way of processing it, we'd just be overloaded and not be able to really make any decisions and, and really do anything. Um, you know, about 99% of all the sensory information that comes in actually ends up getting discarded. It's either uh, irrelevant or unimportant. So for instance, how many of you feel the shirts on your body right now? No, it's not really all that important. You felt it initially, you probably put the, the scrub top on, but then afterwards you're like, okay, well, I don't need to really think about that. So those inputs typically get deadened or they get discarded. Uh, you don't have to worry about that, right? Or things like drowning out sound. Like most of you probably can't even hear me right now. <laughs> so I record things and then post them up later, right? Or things like, you know, uh, focus on one object in your visual field, kind of like shutting out other things. A lot of signals in the beginning uh, inhibited in these cases there, right? Um, once you have information that is considered important enough that the brain wants to pay attention to it, a lot of these things end up getting stored as memory. We'll talk about memory more in depth later on as far as like long-term versus short-term memory. Um, but again, a lot of this information can be stored up in the cerebral cortex for later use, right? We'll talk about facilitation where each time uh, we have these signals that are going to be coming in, activating some of these sensory pathways, um, you know, they tend to become more capable of transmitting that signal a second time. Um, so that way we have this adaptation that occurs where uh, the signals are gonna be much more quick the second time around, we're able to respond to it that much better. Um, and again, sometimes you can actually have things um, that will trigger off certain pathways without even having the original sensory input, right? Uh, so for instance, you ever have like, um, trying to think of a good example or something, where for instance, like, you know, you smell a certain thing and like it triggers all these memories of like growing up with grandma or something like that. Um, again, that pathway, even though you don't have grandma's apple pie right in front of you, but something can trigger off that, that memory and all of a sudden you're, you're taken back and you think of simpler times, I don't know, <laughs> whatever it happens to be, right? Okay, so again, looking at major levels, uh, the system here again, the spinal cord level, good for transmitting signals, 
good for these reflex arcs. And again, a lot of those are independent of brain function as we looked at with the skeletal muscle function earlier, right? Lower brain function, the subcortical level is good for, um, you know, subconscious activities like containing, you know, controlling blood pressure, looking at things like breathing, your wakefulness, things like that. And also a lot of emotional patterns uh, get controlled there as well, right? So anger, excitement, sexual response, we'll look at more of those in detail a little bit later on the next, um, next unit. And finally, the higher brain level, the cortical level is going to be more like long-term memory storage, you know, conscious control of movements, you know, saying like, okay, I want to make sure I walk over to that door or in turn off the light, whatever the case may be. Uh, a lot of the thought processes are actually occurring here, right? I, I at least see with, with uh, my experience, a lot of people are missing this level, it seems like, but that's just anecdotal, so I don't actually know that. Anyway, okay, so let's go into the actual details here. Let's look at the different cells that are actually making up uh, the, the CNS. Um, we're going to find that we have these neuroglia, these glial cells. Two main types are going to be found in the peripheral nervous system. Again, I try not to say PNS because otherwise I say it too quick, then you know, we're not talking uh, urology anymore. Um, but some of the ones we're going to see include things like the Schwann cells, which are high up on my list of my favorite cells to say. Um, these are going to be good because they help to form myelin sheaths around the peripheral axons, right? So you can kind of see um, these help them to form the, the myelin sheath. Why is the myelin sheath so important? Helps with conduction, right? Usually speeds up conduction because, um, again, if you have an action potential, you don't want it to go from every sodium channel all the way down the length of the axon. That would take forever, right? So, again, we have um, these uh, myelin sheets that occur. And again, what do you call this right here? That will break? Besides whatever's right on the slide. Yeah, that node of Ranvier. That allows for basically the action potential to kind of jump from node to node to node, and that goes a lot faster. Um, what do you call it if you're missing a lot of these? Um, do you have like an autoimmune condition that gets rid of a lot of these myelin sheets? Multiple sclerosis, yeah, and so you see a ton of problems with them being able to conduct, uh, conduct signals appropriately. You know, you have a lot of light neuropathies and a lot of other uh, issues that develop from that, so it's a big, big deal there. They also have some phagocytic activity, which is good, because um, typically we want to keep the CNS as sterile as possible. Um, also going to be some satellite cells here that kind of help support the, the ganglia. Uh, they can help to control things like the chemical environment around the peripheral nervous system cells, uh, make sure they're kind of kept at their kind of right set point. All right. Now, as far as the neuroglia found within the CNS, we're going to have things like oligodendrocytes. These are going to be uh, kind of the, the equivalents of the, the, the Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system, but they're forming the myelin sheath around the axons, the CNS neurons. Uh, we have things like neuroglia, which are going to be migrating around, going you know, to help to uh, basically provide phagocytic functions, be able to get rid of things like degenerated materials, so that way we don't have a bunch of waste products sitting around. Um, things like astrocytes are going to be good for controlling the external environment, and we'll look at those in a second. Um, and they also have these uh, ependymal cells. They're going to actually be aligned the ventricles, and these are going to be good for secreting cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, what happens if you have too much cerebral spinal fluid being made? Hmm. Uh, is that again? Well, that's more of like a developmental sort of issue here. But the main thing I was trying to get to is basically you're going to have uh, increased intracranial pressure. So you can actually have patients who develop, um, they produce too much CSF, and you actually have to have things like shunts put in. So that way they can drain down into somewhere else, like maybe like the peritoneal space or something like that. So too much CSF can actually be bad because typically the brain, the brain likes to be under, uh, you know, a nominal amount of pressure. Uh, too much can be very bad. If you, as again, um, the skull, for most people, typically a pretty closed sort of system there. If the brain gets too much pressure, where's the brain, where's the outlet of pressure going to go to? Through the brainstem, right through the bottom, and then you have a herniation uh, of the brain. That's no good, right? So it's usually pretty fatal for the most part. So not good. Um, maybe we'll cover that in other classes. But going forward, again, you can refer back to uh, this slide here, talking about the different uh, sorts of cells and their, their main functions, which we kind of alluded to already. Okay, so the myelin sheet, as I mentioned, very good um, you know, within the CNS. It's going to be the oligodendrocytes making those versus the Schwann cells out in the uh, peripheral nervous system. Um, again, this is what helps us to give those axons uh, their kind of white colors. So when we say like the white matter versus the gray matter, that's what we're kind of referring to there. Um, typically, the gray matter itself is going to be all the cell bodies that lack those myelin sheaths. And again, we don't need them everywhere necessarily, but again, we're having kind of long distance transmission, which is why you see that a lot in the spinal cord. Is we're going to see a lot of those myelin sheaths being really important there for transmitting signals from, say, from your head down to your toes, as the case may be. All right. Um, astrocytes, these are very important because, at least from, from my purposes uh, as, a, as a pharmacist, um, for the blood-brain barrier, right? So you're going to find these astrocytes are going to be lining the blood vessels here. And typically, do we like things like drugs to get into the brain? Typically, no. Typically, the brain wants to keep all kinds of toxins and, and bacteria and all kinds of things like that out of the CNS as much as possible, and that's due to the blood-brain barrier, okay? This is where you're going to see things like um, things like lipophilicity of drugs or other substances will help it to actually cross here because, again, these are all just biological membranes. If you have something like this very lipophilic, very easy to get across in the blood-brain barrier and can, can affect the body, right? Um, you guys remember we talked about uh, P-glycoprotein 
we have efflux pumps. There's also a lot of efflux pumps that uh, reside here as well um, within the CNS, within the blood brain barrier to make sure we're kind of sending things from the brain out to make sure that we kind of keep drugs out. So did I tell you about the, the lady who overdosed on loperamide? That was what that lady was doing essentially. She was trying to bypass her uh, pig like protein because she ended up taking something that inhibited it drug called cimetidine or Pepsid, uh, which I'd never recommend for any patients. Um, but basically, she was able to get this drug that normally doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Normally, it's a drug we use for, for diarrhea. But she was able to overcome that. Why don't she read it online or figure it out herself? Who could say? Um, but she was able to get all that drug into the CNS and eventually cause all kinds of problems for herself. It probably was not the high she was necessarily looking for. But the blood-brain barrier is very good at keeping things out. Um, the other big thing we run into is imagine you have... Um, Things like meningitis, right? So you have like a bacterial infection in the meninges. Um, this can affect how well certain drugs get across, right? So if I need to treat a patient for a bacterial infection, do um, you think bigger molecules or smaller molecules like to get across? Again, usually when you have inflammation, usually the gaps will get bigger, so certain things can cross in those situations, but typically smaller is better. And so certain drugs we like to use uh, uh, won't cross at all in some cases unless they have like a lot of inflammation going on there. So these are things that will, will come up again later on, but typically blood-brain barrier likes to keep things out. Again, you're going to find lots of efflux pumps. Um, it's very selective about what it's actually going to be letting through, um, but typically things can can skip across if it's very lipophilic. You know, things like alcohol. If alcohol wasn't lipophilic, it wouldn't be able to get across the CNS. And guess what? You wouldn't get drunk when you drink it. Um, you know, other things like that. So uh, sometimes there's special transports that let things across, but typically we like to keep things out. There's also another interesting thing we can do. Um, if you have a, a drugs with a permanent charge, um, they can't cross either, right? Because again, we, we talked about things like the henderson hasselbeck equation and how things with charges typically don't like to cross those <coughs> membranes. Uh, so a good example of this, um, you guys are uh, familiar with um, uh, antihistamine drugs. So things like Claritin, right? Or things like uh, Zyrtec, right? Those are what we call second generation antihistamines. They have a positive charge and they don't get across the blood brain barrier. So what's the difference between taking a Benadryl versus a Zyrtec? Which one makes you sleepier? Benadryl. Benadryl can actually get across pretty easily across that blood-brain barrier, which makes you sleepy, right? Zyrtec, on the other hand, has got that positive charge. It actually can't get across. And so that's why it's a non-sedating sort of antihistamine. Again, sometimes you want the sedative sort of effect, and that's why Benadryl might be better for one person versus Zyrtec's better for another one, right? So if you need to get up and go to class at 8 o'clock, guess what? You probably don't want to take Benadryl. However, Zyrtec might be good for you. So again, it all goes back to that blood-brain barrier and trying to prevent things from getting across. Okay. Which time do I love? I have some time. Um, so looking at the CNS uh, synapses here, so again, looking at the actual communication between the axon of one nerve to the, the dendrite of another, uh, we're going to see that uh, typically these impulses are going to be sent via action potentials. That's going to be kind of the main thing we're going to be seeing being transmitted here. Um, in some cases, you may find impulses being blocked or inhibited, as the case may be. We'll look at that, a few examples of that in a moment. Um, and it can change from either single or repetitive impulses, right? So in some cases, you may find you're getting a ton of signals coming in, all being uh, excitatory. Um, in some cases, you may actually find you want to try to deaden that down, right? Because you don't want to have too much signal coming in. Because uh, again, if you have too many of these neurons firing off, what could be uh, could potentially occur? The neurons are all just kind of firing off all at the same time, very disorganized, cause a seizure, right? You want to have a seizure occur there. So that's one of the things you like to prevent. Like, so we'll see that uh, very similar to how the heart, we want electricity to be conducted in one nice kind of concerted sort of, uh, of effort in one direction. Same thing happens in the brain. You want to make sure things are only traveling uh, the right pathways. Otherwise you have uh, epilepsy that can develop procedures that, that can develop um, analogous to arrhythmias in the heart, right? So, uh, and again, a lot of times you're also integrating signals from other neurons that are coming in, so that way they can have kind of um, either excitatory or inhibitory sort of effects, depending on what the signal pathway is going to be here. Now, the synapse, uh, synapses themselves can either be chemical or electrical. Electrical just means we're having these gap junctions that are here, so that way if an action potential travels along the neuron, it's able to transmit that very easily, right? So it's able to transmit those signals uh, with no problem uh, from one to another uh, via these gap junctions, okay? In this case, you can actually find that there's bilateral transmissions is possible. It's not common, but it's one of those things you can see, or if you had a, a, another action potential coming on this neuron, you can actually travel up to this direction. More often than not, we're going to be looking at chemical uh, sort of synapses here, and this only allows for one-way communication. And basically, this is where you have neurotransmitters that can either excite, they can inhibit, they can modify things. They're going to be released, usually from these synaptic vesicles. They're going to be released on into and in, in interacting with various types of receptors. We've already covered a lot of those receptors uh, back in farm, but we may talk about them briefly here, as you remember. But things like ion channels, things like G-protein uh, receptors, all those things can be interacted with, with these neurotransmitters coming from 
a presynaptic neuron there, okay? Um, we'll go over these in more detail, but this is where things like acetylcholine come into play, things like glutamate, serotonin, GABA, all those are uh, um, playing a big role here, okay? And again, looking at the synapse, um, looking at the anatomy of a neuron, we talked about the soma, which is the, the kind of the body of the neuron itself, the, the axon, single axon for neurons, dendrites, and then also talking about some of the, uh, the kind of the presynaptic terminals. They're coming in from other neurons themselves. So these are the other axons coming in. And again, we're going to see that some of these are going to be excitatory, trying to facilitate more action potential. Some of these are going to be inhibitory. They're trying to prevent them from occurring in the first place. Okay. And again, synaptic vesicles, this is just a form of exocytosis where you're going to have some sort of signal that comes along, typically either like a, uh, usually an action potential that will come along and will trigger, usually influx of things like calcium. Calcium is a very strong signaler for a lot of these vesicles then to release themselves. So via exocytosis, release that neurotransmitter onto the various receptors, whatever it's going to be uh, located with. Um, Typically, you're going to find it with more calcium uh, being opened up. And again, these are voltage-gated calcium channels. More calcium coming in, the more vesicles being released. So if you have a lot of uh, action potentials all coming in at the same time, uh, you can see this is going to let more calcium in. As the voltage gets higher, it's going to allow for more vesicles to be released. You have more release of the neurotransmitter to carry a signal downstream. Okay. Okay. Um, talk about receptor types. So we have things like gated ion channels. So certainly you can have some that are going to be cation channels. Again, cations are positive or negative. I was thinking it's kind of counterintuitive. I think cats are being pretty negative animals, but maybe that's just me. But however, cat, cat ions are going to be positive. So this is going to be things like sodium flowing in, potassium, calcium. Typically, these are going to be excitatory. Okay, cation channels are going to be excitatory, and that makes sense because what does that have? What does that do to the the potential of the cell that's going to be interacting with? That allows those ions to flow into. It's more positive, which means its threshold to get to an action potential is that much closer much more likely to have an action potential. So those are excitatory. On the other case, you can find anion channels. And the primary one here is going to be chloride. If I allow chloride to flow in, which is negative, it's going to do what to the electric potential of that cell? It's going to decrease it, make it more negative. It's harder to have an action potential. So this is where we're going to find this is uh, the main thing when, uh, say, for instance, you have someone who's having a seizure, their neurons are firing off too frequently. One of the big ways that we affect that is actually to try to get more chloride into those neurons. Because I know if I make them more negative and make them harder to have an action potential, guess what? You inhibit them, it stops firing, and guess what? The patient can then go to sleep or get more sedated, or whatever happens to be, but they'll stop that seizure in, in most cases there. Okay. Now, um, we also have those metabotropic receptors we talked about pretty frequently, so things like G-protein um, uh, coupled receptors, tyrosine kinase receptors, all those different ones. Uh, and again, a lot of those are working through second messenger systems, like either cyclo-KMP, cyclo-GMP, um, you know, and also triphosphate, all of the good ones we talked about in, in farm. Now, here are a list of neurotransmitters. I expect you to know everything about, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, we'll talk about a lot of these, um, but a lot of these we've already seen. We already know a lot about a lot of these neurotransmitters. There's things like acetylcholine. Has anyone heard of acetylcholine before? Perhaps I've mentioned it once or twice. Yes, you know a lot about acetylcholine. We know a lot about uh, norepi. Uh, we'll talk about things like dopamine, serotonin, histamine, um, GABA. I'm not going to cover each one of these in, in gory detail. However, you know, if we've talked about them before, you know, you already have a good idea. Like, you know, what does prolactin do? What does growth hormone do? You have a pretty good idea of that stuff already. We're going to go into more detail on um, some of the ones we're going to see most frequently seen in the CNS at the biggest effects. And also, very frequently with farm, we're going to be dealing with a lot of these drugs that are going to be affecting the system pretty, pretty directly, right?